Thanks everyone for coming and a big hello too to everyone who's watching this on the live feed, including, I understand it, an audience at um, Kellogg College, Oxford. So, hello. Um, I've cho chosen to speak today on medieval ideas about sex and sexuality. Now, the term Middle Ages covers a period of roughly a thousand years of history, stretching from the fall of the Roman Empire to around the year 1500. I'll be citing examples from the last four centuries or so within that time span. And my question is whether people in this period had a concept of what we call sexual orientation. So here's one modern definition of the concept. This is from the American Psychological Association's web pages, and I'll just um, read from it. Sexual orientation refers to an enduring pattern of emotional, romantic, and or sexual attractions to men, women, or both sexes. Sexual orientation also refers to a person's sense of identity based on those attractions, related behaviours, and membership in a community of others who share those attractions. Sexual orientation is usually discussed in terms of three categories. Heterosexual, gay or lesbian, and bisexual. So outlined here are three crucial features in the modern concept of sexual orientation. That it's a pattern of sexual attraction that persists over time. That it describes a person's identity and personhood. And that it can be reduced down to three or four categories, depending on the sex of those you're attracted to. Now, most historians now agree that this understanding of sexual orientation emerged relatively recently. Before the late 19th century, people didn't imagine themselves primarily in terms of attraction to members of the same or opposite sex. The term cited by the American Psychological Association hadn't even been invented yet. A classic case in point is the medieval concept of sodomy. Sodom was a city which, according to the book of Genesis in the Bible, was destroyed because its inhabitants were guilty of a nameless transgression, probably in hospitality to strangers. In medieval Europe, the term sodomy, derived from the name of this biblical city, was applied to, applied to a range of sexual activities that were deemed unacceptable to Christians. On the one hand, when confessors in early medieval monasteries catalogued the penances due to monks engaging in sodomitic practices, as they were called, often they focused on acts of anal sex between males, or what they called in Latin, copulation in terga. That's to say, copulation in the rear or in the backside. On the other hand, churchmen might refer more ambiguously to a whole variety of sins deserving of punishment grouping together practices associated with the spilling of semen, this idea could apply in theory to each and every sex act that wasn't aimed at human reproduction within the bond of marriage. So here's a drawing from a picture Bible in the British Library. This is a manuscript known as the Edgerton Genesis. And this depicts, depicts all manner of illicit activities um, that are being carried out by Sodom's um, inhabitants. So we have, for example, this lone man here who appears to be peering at his groin um, and it's probably a sign that he's about to masturbate. Now, one later reader of the manuscript has um, sort of rubbed away um, um, the area around his groin, um, suggesting um, that they've been offended um, by some aspect of this um, image. Um, we also see um, another male couple who engage in what looks like a cross between sexual intercourse and wrestling. And um, again, someone's <laughs> sort of taken a finger to the groin areas of these men, so um, offence has been caused. Um, we also have um, this chap here who um, seems to be stuffing food into his mouth, um, and greed was often seen as a prelude to sexual sins in the Middle Ages, and also specifically associated um, in books of the Bible um, which um, appear after the book of Genesis. Um, greed is associated again with the sins of Sodom in that context. Um, also down at the bottom, um, one of the Sodomites is thwacking some beggars who are at the left there. One of them is holding out a begging bowl, um, and um, this is showing the sin of violence. Violence, again, um, is associated with the Genesis story um, of Sodom. 
So a confused array of sins associated with the sins of Sodom, which give the name to this word sodomy. Other layers of obscurity could also be applied. So phrases such as the unmentionable vice or the vice that should not be named were used throughout the Middle Ages and beyond as code words for sodomy. Now this lack of a definitional centre endowed sodomy with enormous scapegoating potential so that in time the word came to be applied to political enemies or to people guilty of religious crimes such as heresy. And this state of affairs famously led one modern commentator, the French philosopher Michel Foucault, to describe sodomy as an utterly confused category. Even more confusing for a modern audience, steeped in the idea that human beings can be divided up according to their erotic preference for one sex or another, it's been argued that sodomy was predominantly applied to sexual behaviour in the Middle Ages, to acts rather than identities or cells. And this makes it, so the story goes, fundamentally different from more recent terms such as gay or lesbian, which are used to denote a particular identity or personality type that persists over time. So rather than describing, as the American Psychological Association puts it, an enduring pattern of sexual attraction, theoretically, sodomy could apply to each and every act of fleshly vice that doesn't fall within marriage and lead to reproduction. In other words, anybody could be tarnished with the brush of sodomy or sins against nature if they didn't perform as they should in the bedchamber, at least theoretically. Sodomy was a practice to which every human being, as a fallen being, was potentially susceptible, rather than being associated with a distinct minority of individuals. So inspired by this line of thinking, a consensus has emerged among historians. Before a new system of sexuality emerged in modernity, which led to the invention of identity categories such as homosexuality and heterosexuality, the idea that humans have a distinct sexuality or sexual orientation would have been unthinkable. Now, although there seem to have been some dissenters to this viewpoint, most historians today remain reticent about applying the phrase sexual orientation to periods prior to modernity. And I'll just give you um, a few representative examples from recent um, publications. So in one book we're told that lesbian does appear in pre-modern texts, but only very rarely and with shades of meaning different from modern notions of stable sexual orientation. Here's another. It's doubtful whether we're dealing with expressions of sexual orientation in the modern sense. And just one more. The Middle Ages had no notion of sexual orientation. Now, I should say at the outset that in lots of respects, I find these arguments very persuasive. I agree that the concept of sexual orientation as an enduring aspect of personhood or identity would probably have made little sense to medieval people, especially where our categories such as heterosexuality or homosexuality are concerned. And I also continue to see the value in questioning the idea that medieval understandings of sexuality were essentially the same as ours. Even in the modern world, there are individuals who are less willing or able to identify themselves according to ideas of an enduring or preeminent sense of sexual selfhood. Not everyone sees him or herself as falling neatly into the categories listed on the American Psychological Association's web pages. Yet, I also wonder whether anything is to be gained from viewing medieval sexualities precisely through the prism of orientation. What does it mean for sexuality to be experienced as something that's oriented? That's to say, an expression of desire that's directed towards some object and not towards others. What happens when we train our eyes on the spatial dimensions to medieval encounters with sex? With the time remaining, I want to present to you a couple of case studies that demonstrate how while medieval understandings of sex were clearly different from our own, they were nonetheless concerned with directing or redirecting desire along particular pathways. Now the categories I'll be discussing 
virginity on the one hand and sodomy on the other, both of these categories did have currency in the Middle Ages, and both can be seen as constituting orientations, specifically with respect to the directional language and imagery in which they're couched. So to virginity first. Well, controlling sexual desire was a necessary starting point for anyone wishing to become a monk or nun or in the later Middle Ages to become a priest. But the individuals who devoted themselves to a life of chastity in this period weren't required to renounce desire altogether. Virginity required self-discipline for sure, but it wasn't an exercise simply in repression. Rather, virginity involved channeling desire from the world, redirecting that desire towards a spiritual goal, that's to say, God. And because reaching this goal entailed sublimation of desire, not repression of desire, those taking up virginity as a lifestyle conceived it as a distinct identity, a manner of directing oneself towards God and away from the world that differentiated virgins from other members of society. So let's just take a look at one of these individuals, someone who dedicated themselves to a life of chastity. And my example is a woman called Christina, who was born in Huntingdon at the end of the 11th century, eventually becoming head of a religious house near St Albans called Markiate Priory. Christina's path to holiness was recorded by monks from St Albans in a biography commissioned before her death. This life of Christina of Markiate records how Christina's vocation as a virgin had already been mapped out from an early age. So even as an infant, we're told, she used to beat her flesh with whips whenever she thought that she'd done something wrong. She'd speak with Christ at night on her bed, or she'd imagine herself lying on her own deathbed. Now, this is pretty strong stuff for a young child. Um, and these episodes are interspersed with passages expressing Christina's intense desire to turn towards God and draw near him by dedicating herself to inviolable virginity. So just here's a brief quotation from the life of Christina of Mark VIII, where we're told, thereafter she shrank from all the pomp of the world and turning to God. I've given a couple of little snippets of Latin phrases here, because this is an English, modern English translation of a of a Latin text, but just to give you a sense of the direction or vocabulary that's being used here, converses related to the modern English word convert, for example. To convert, to turn to God with her whole heart, she said, Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. It's good for me to draw near, to adhere, to ad I mean, it's related to the modern English word adhere, to God. Deign to grant me, beseech thee, purity and inviolable virginity. And when, as a young woman, Christina's parents resolve to marry her off to a nobleman, she stridently resists. A local churchman, who's been enlisted by Christina's father to persuade her to consummate the marriage, puts it thus. So her father says, We've tried our best to bend, to inclinare, to incline your daughter to your will, but we've made no headway. The resolution of this virgin is based on steadfast virtue. So even in infancy then, Christina possesses an inbuilt orientation towards chastity. The words used in these passages to describe her efforts to protect her virginity are striking. Christina's parents try to bend their daughter's will and to correct what in their eyes is the wayward direction of her desire. But the virgin remains steadfast in her pursuit of God. Now, as I've already mentioned, virginity didn't simply require saying no to desire. It involved redirecting desire towards a distinct field of objects, heavenly bodies, and so transforming it into something spiritually ennobling. And in keeping with this, Christina's biographer records several occasions when she encounters Christ in his humanity. Christ is conceived in surprisingly worldly terms in these passages. So he inhabits the role um, of um, a wealthy lover and a jealous husband. And here's um, one passage where Christina um, is describing Christ, comparing him with um, the man that she's been betrothed to by her parents, and says, for who is richer than Christ? So she sees Christ as being a, a material figure. 
She also imagines Christ as a small child who she holds to her breast of this passage, puts it with immeasurable delight. So we're told that she held him at one moment to her virginal breast, at another felt him in her innermost being. And then also, finally, Christ turns up again in her life as a mysterious pilgrim whose good looks and table talk set Christina and her sister's hearts aflutter. So we're told while both sisters were admiring the attractiveness of his features, they were filled with such spiritual joy that they felt they had before them an angel. So this is just to convey the um, desiring aspect um, of these virgins. Um, and it's episodes such as these, um, in which Christ is clearly being positioned as an object of desire, a viable alternative to earthly lovers, that constitutes Christina's virginity as a sexuality, an orientation towards a specific field of desirable objects, which conditions her inner life and erotic sensibility. The medieval virgin is, in these senses, a personage, one possessing a past, a case history, and a childhood. Nothing that went into her total composition was unaffected by her sexuality. It was everywhere present in her, at the root of all her actions. Now, the lines I've just been quoting aren't from the book of um, the life of Christina of Marchiate. They're not from a medieval text. These are from um, a book by the philosopher Foucault, who I mentioned earlier. And Foucault is describing in this passage that I've just been quoting, the emergence of a completely different category from virginity. He's talking about homosexuality in the 19th century and how this differs from previous ideas such as sodomy. Without wishing to underplay some of the clear differences between modern concepts of gay identity and medieval concepts of virginity, I think it's possible to see certain resemblances. And one similarity is the directional language that's used to describe both. Modern homosexuality has become attached at various stages in its development to directional words and imagery, terms such as pervert, deviant, bender, or even queer, capture the perceived disorienting effects of being gay. And what's perceived to be queer about homosexuality is the fact that it turns away from what's thought to be normal. Now, normality is an idea that only took hold in the 19th century with the rise of statistical science. In the Middle Ages, people didn't share our concept of sexual norms. All desires directed towards the world and away from God were viewed as problematic. Virginity provided women such as Christina with a structure that allowed them to channel their desires along a different path. And so there's an occasion when Christina is struck by physical afflictions of various kinds, which she's described as bearing calmly, and she's rewarded for her steadfastness with a vision of Christ offering his cross and instructing her always to hold it in a straight line. So Christ says to her, take this cross, therefore, and hold it firmly, slanting neither to the left, right or left. Always hold it straight. And it's that phrase, holding it straight, that I've um, taken as the title for my lecture today. In Christina's vision, it's virginity, not heterosexuality, that constitutes the practice of holding it straight. Christ presents his devotion to his cross as a kind of straightening device with the capacity to correct the deviant pathways pursued by unchaste individuals. In these ways, I'm suggesting Christina's virginal positioning possesses qualities analogous to sexual orientation. Now, of course, sodomy was on the opposite end of the spectrum to virginity, but Christina would have viewed sodomy as just one among a multitude of carnal sins to which humans are susceptible. As such, I'm not saying here that medieval categories of desire were identical to our own, simply that they share certain features with what we call orientations. Whereas in the modern world, as described on the American Psychological Association's website, we divide the world up according to whether people are heterosexual or homosexual or sometimes bisexual, in the Middle Ages, the principal division was between chastity and its opposites, opposites which included all manner of fleshly activities. Yet even chaste individuals were occasionally accused of unnatural sinfulness, as in this passage 
here from a handbook that was originally devised for female solitaries in 13th century England. The text narrator issues a stark warning against the lustful behaviours to which these lone women, known as anchorites, are susceptible. We're told, I dare not name the unnatural offspring of this devil's scorpion. The lecture is described as being the devil's scorpion. But sorry she may be who, without a friend or with, has fed the offspring of her lustfulness thus, which I may not speak about for shame, nor dare not for fear, lest someone learns more evil than she knows and is tempted by it. Now this passage is gathering together several different sexual practices under the heading of unnatural sins. It condemns acts performed without a friend or with, which presumably includes masturbation. The gender of this friend who it might be performed with is not clear in the passage. Um, and the narrator's circumspection, um, phrases like, I dare not name, I may not speak, also calls sodomy into being in the context of a refusal to incite it. So this is a kind of early version of the idea of the love that dare not speak its name. If we turn now to artistic encounters with sodomy, which find ways to transform that confused, unspeakable category into something visually comprehensible, I'd like to show how sodomites, like virgins, could be perceived in directional terms. However, rather than channeling their desire along the straight path outlined by Christ in Christina's biography, sodomites are represented being literally twisted individuals, oriented towards a host of improper objects, actions, and bodies. Now, as a preamble to this discussion, it's worth mentioning that while women were sometimes included in the category of sodomy, especially after the 13th century, when several scholars and theologians saw fit to condemn homoerotic relations between females as well as males, visual depictions of women engaging in sodomitic acts, however defined, are relatively rare. One place in medieval art where women were depicted intimately embracing and kissing is the theme of the visitation which shows the Virgin Mary greeting her cousin Elizabeth prior to the birth of Jesus and John the Baptist, as described in Luke's Gospel. And this is a page from the St Albans Psalter, which was a manuscript that was probably adapted for Christina of Marchiate's own use, and it contains a striking painting um, of the, the, the visitation, which shows Mary and Elizabeth embracing, touching their heads together, and looking into one another's eyes. And sometimes visitations might even show the Virgin stroking the chin of her cousin, a sign of affection and intimacy that sometimes also had erotic connotations. And this is a book of ours that was owned by a 14th century noblewoman. But scenes such as these didn't generally raise any eyebrows because it was assumed that unless they dressed or acted as men, women weren't capable of acting sexually with other women. Very occasionally, it's possible to find erotically charged scenes of women embracing or kissing in medieval manuscripts, but these, these are usually found in conjunction with mythical stories of women being miraculously transformed into men after falling in love with a girl. Turning to artworks designed for more public settings, such as churches and cathedrals, sodomy was generally represented in the context of its punishment. And these scenes show, um, um, those shown being punished um, in these scenes are invariably male. In images of this sort, sodomy is no longer, with apologies to Foucault, utterly confused. As I've already mentioned, confessors in the early Middle Ages prescribed penances for monks and clerics who had sex in the sodomitic manner, including an activity described in Latin as fornication in turga, in the rear. Now, the reason why such practices were deemed especially troubling to the church was because, like other activities such as masturbation, they involved the spilling of semen, which diverted it from reproductive ends. And the language used by religious writers in this period thus focused especially on sodomy's disorienting effects on its practitioners. Sodomites were berated for directing their desires towards illicit bodies and bodily orifices, notably the anus, while ignoring or deviating from others. Now here's what one churchman, an Italian monk called Peter Damien, writing in the 11th century, has to say about men who, despite being unworthy of religious office on account of their sodomitical activities, aspire to enter the church. He says, those who cannot cross the threshold of the proper entrance, that's to say the entrance to sacred office, are turned about, wandering in a circle 
of whirling madness. And then he goes on to cite verses from the book of Psalms in which the wicked are described being turned into wheels or going round in circles. So this kind of language contrasts massively with Christina's effort to hold it straight for Christ. And medieval artists developed various strategies for conveying the disorienting effects of sodomy to viewers and dissuading them from participating in these activities. And here's a carving from the celebrated 12th century frieze at Lincoln Cathedral, which shows punishments for sodomy among a series of infernal torments. Two similar looking figures, presumably males, are positioned so that one faces the other's backside in a parody of intercourse in Turga. You see behind a large demon who's perched on the victim's backs and pulls their hair. And meanwhile, there are serpents coiled around the sinner's limbs. Now, this is a panel that used to be located on the cathedral's west front. For conservation reasons, um, it's now been brought um, indoors. But a reconstruction that was carved by the sculptors John Roberts and Alan Micklethwaite and installed on the west front in 2001 conveys these details very clearly. So this is the central scene here. And this scene is flanked by another to the left, which shows a man and a woman having their genitals gnawed by two kind of um, monstrous dragon-like creatures. Um, and then to the right here, we have a scene showing a man who's being chastised for avarice. You can see he's got a money bag around his neck, and there's also a serpent who appears to be gnawing at his genitals as well. So these different fleshly sins are shown as being comparable. Now, sometimes acts of anal penetration were depicted even more graphically, not as sex acts, but as modes of punishment or humiliation. Images of males displaying their backsides to viewers or sometimes risking penetration by weapons or other objects turn up fairly frequently in the margins of illuminated manuscripts. And one of these scenes was used to advertise this talk. And here's another in a 14th century book of hours. Bearing arse was a popular gesture of defiance or a defamatory insult, as in the practice of mooning. So it's worth remembering that such images participate in a wider vocabulary of profanation. The insult's force often stems from the fact that the mooning figure is at one removed from his target. Social power is as important as sexuality in determining the meaning of these scenes. But images such as the one that I'm displaying now here, which show the male actually being penetrated, conjure up a vision of sex in Turga. So we see here a naked male who appears to be plunging a pole into the animal-headed rump of a monstrous hybrid, and he's holding the weapon suggestively at groin height. Another scene of anal touching or penetration can be found high up on the west facade of Bourges Cathedral. And this features among the sinners being pushed into the infernal cauldron, a naked mitred male who's laid out on his back, while a figure behind him appears to be placing a hand between the bishop's buttocks. Meanwhile, to the far right, the sculptors have endowed a demon operating a pair of bellows with, an with oversized genitalia and a grinning face instead of an anus. Now, it's not clear whether the bishop who's having his ass fingered in hell is that's happening as a punishment for practicing sodomy in life. But some Last Judgment paintings produced in Italy at the end of the Middle Ages identify the sinners being impaled or pierced explicitly as sodomites. And the best known of these scenes in the Collegiata of San Gimignano shows among a group of sinners guilty of lust a pair of males who possess labels identifying their sins. So here's um, the um, Last Judgment um, scene um, as it appears, and it's divided into various segments. And I'm now just going to zone in on the scene in the middle right here. And zooming in on this scene, we see that one of the sinners is seated with his legs crossed as fame, flames lick his exposed genitals. An inscription to the boy's left designates him as cattivo. This is a word which in Italian shares the same semantic range as the English word caitiff. That's to say, um, describing him as a vile or wretched individual. The sinner's mouth is penetrated by a rod, which emerges from the mouth of another male to his right. And this second sinner is laid out on his back. The rod which exits the second sinner's mouth enters his body via the anus, and it's inserted by a demon, who holds the other end at groin height. 
Other demons torment the man by applying pincers to his feet and pouring wax or oil over his belly. And the sinner wears a hat bearing the legend Sotto Mito. This is a play on the Italian word for sodomite. And the sodomite in these scenes is also clearly being equated with cooked meat, slow roasted for eternity on a spit. And this is also a feature of several other paintings from around this time. So here's an example from Bologna. And here's another which is now quite badly damaged from the Campo Santo in Pisa. And these scenes show naked males being turned by devils on implements resembling rotisseries. The different labels that are applied to each of the sinners in the San Gimignano scene, cative and sodomite, may also allude to the fact that each individual is being punished for inhabiting a different role, active or passive. He may even be experiencing a reversal of the sexual role he undertook in life. Crucially, because the scenario takes place in hell, a space where the damned will suffer torment without end, the sinners are confined to these roles eternally. Their very beings are inscribed by the acts they suffer or perform. So sodomy becomes a practice for which individuals have an enduring taste or proclivity. Perhaps in instances such as this, we're not so far from aspects of the definition of sexual orientation I was citing at the outset. How, though, do paintings such as these convey the directional imagery we also saw shaping perceptions of virginity in the period? Well, in a very basic sense, the object towards which the man labelled Sotomito is oriented is the spit on which he's roasted. His impalement on the spit means that he's out of alignment with most of the other sinners in this painting. At the same time, he's literally been captured in a moment of twisting and turning, akin to the circle of whirling madness which, for commentators such as Peter Damien, characterises the sodomite's condition. Additionally, the sinner's horizontal alignment brings into focus his relationship with another sinner in the painting. So in the zone of punishment to the left, among the avaricious, there's another male sinner who's been laid out on his back in an almost identical position. This time, however, instead of suffering anal penetration, a devil excretes gold coins in his mouth, a punishment for the crime of usury. That's to say, lending money at interest. The analogy here hinges on the fact that both categories of sin involve illicit forms of consumption. But whereas the money lender is oriented towards a sterile object, money, which he attempts to render nourishing through loans at interest, the sodomite is oriented towards a productive substance, semen, which he renders sterile through its reception in the anus or the mouth. In each case, the orientation is failed in the sense that it leads precisely nowhere. As the analogy with the usurer in the San Gimignano painting powerfully demonstrates, the sodomite's tendency towards sin is an orientation that every fallen human being can be said to share. The remedy to all this, as the life of Christina of Marchiate intimates, is to follow a straight path to God. But instead, sodomites, like all sinners in hell, in fact, have turned away from God and towards a field of improper bodies and things. They reveal the twisted, slant-wise directions humans will invariably take if they fail to channel their desires along a more virtuous path. So my argument isn't that the medieval sodomite possessed an orientation that's gay in the senses in which that term is often used today. 20th and 21st century gay and lesbian identities organised around protest and pride which emerged partly in response to the pathologizing and minoritizing perspectives of the modern era, contrast with medieval notions of sodomy as a fluid and disorderly category of human sinfulness. Yet I hope I've also captured the extent to which, despite some indisputable differences, medieval encounters with sexuality could, like our own, be filtered through a directional vocabulary. In these ways, virgins and sodomites were fundamentally oriented, which is to say that their actions were perceived as shaping their identities and their worlds. Thank you. We've got five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, we do have uh, a few minutes uh, for some, well, probably one or two questions, because we do have to vacate by five minutes too. It's a question over there. Yeah. 
thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, when, when you spoke about um, virginity, something that came to my mind is uh, that statue, uh, The Ecstasy of St. Uh, Teresa by Bernini, uh, which is clearly after the period you are mm -hmm. treating, but it seems that uh, it, it's actually belonging to the same aspect of sublimation of uh, uh, sexual desire into um, into something that is different. But it, if I remember that there are different accounts of these saints that uh, feel this ecstasy feeling, which is uh, certainly uh, very similar to the what we call an orgasm. Mm. So do we have any of these uh, accounts like this uh, even prior to the age of Bernini, which is the only um, example that I, comes to my mind on this uh, matter. Yeah, well, thanks for, for, thanks for that question. Um, that's a very interesting um, observation. I mean, I think um, it really captures the point that I was trying to make about how virginity is not about asexuality, it is asexuality in the sense that it's about desire and it's about desire for God and that can be expressed in what seems to us to be quite physical or erotic terms. Um, and so I think certainly Benini's statue um, does capture that um, sort of what you're talking about is that kind of ecstatic or even orgasmic element of desire for God. And I think you can see a um, much earlier precedence for that as well, not necessarily so much um, visually, although there are um, perhaps some examples, but certainly in texts describing union with God in terms that to a modern audience might seem to um, be sexualized or eroticized in certain ways. Another question? Yes, just here. Hi, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but um, I was curious about the, the definition of sodomy and how it seemed to be focused on as a purely male-male activity um, and not acknowledged or um, condemned as something that would be into gender, for want of a better description. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point. And I, I mean, I did um, mention briefly that um, women are included under the um, heading of sodomy in the later Middle Ages in certain contexts, particularly from the 13th century. Um, the word sodomy itself is not always used in those contexts, although well, sometimes to, towards the very end of the Middle Ages in the 15th century it can be applied, for instance, in certain legal frameworks. Um, but other um, euphemisms such as um, the unmentionable vice, um, unnatural sins and so forth are used in the context of women. In terms of visual imagery, um, as I explained, um, we don't have um, as much um, material because um, sodomy is being represented in the context of its punishment in these images, and it's usually a male couple that represents that. However, medieval artists did confront um, erotic relations between women by going through um, the route of mythology, classical mythology, stories from classical mythology about um, gender transformation. Um, also, um, there's a story um, which is told by Ovid in the Metamorphoses about the goddess Diana um, and one of her band of virgins called Callisto, um, who um, is basically raped by Jupiter, who appears to Callisto in the form of Diana. So he kind of drags up um, in order to have sexual relations with her, gets Callisto pregnant. She gets in all sorts of trouble nine months later and gets expelled from Diana's company of virgins. But you do see certain medieval... Um, 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 late medieval artists um, depicting this story showing Jupiter dressed up as a woman um, embracing kissing Callisto. Sometimes in some of these images um, there's not much differentiation between the two so it really does look like two women who are having um, erotic um, um, relations with one another. Um, so that is one context in which um, you know um, albeit through the lens of gender transformation um, sodomy between women is being represented. Thank you very much for those two questions. I do have to close it now, so it remains for me to say thank you very much indeed, Bob, for that perspective on the Middle Ages. Thank you very much. Thank you.